So what we will do is uh, we will begin our next session uh, of the conference. And so I've got three, we have three presenters coming up and I will just introduce all three of them in the order that I have them here. And then you can all decide how you wanna present. Uh, so first up is uh, Leslie Jill Patterson. She teaches in the creative writing program at Texas Tech University. Her prose has appeared recently in the Rumpus, Prime Number Magazine, Hotel America, and Brevity. She works as the uh, case storyteller for public defenders representing uh, indigent men and women charged in, uh, with capital murder and facing execution. Uh, Dennis Covington will be presenting. He's the author of two novels and four nonfiction books, including Salvation on Sand Mountain, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times Magazine, Vogue, Esquire, The American Scholar, and many other periodicals. His latest book, uh, Revelation, A Search for Faith in a Violent Religious World, uh, that's the name of it. Uh, he is Professor Emeritus of Creative Writing at Texas Tech. And finally, we have William Winthy, uh, whose fourth book of poems, God's Foolishness, was published by LSU Press in April 2016. He has received poetry fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Texas Commission on the Arts, and two Pushcart Prizes. For the past dozen years, he has been working on a collection of poems provoked by the life and art of the American expatriate painter, James McNeil Whistler. There you go. Thanks, Jill. Jesus. Are y'all okay after that? I'm not. No, I mean, we can get away with that. Can y'all hear me all right? Thank y'all for coming. It's delight I'm delighted to be back at Tech. I'm retired, and I'm delighted to be retired from Tech. <laughs> so, uh, what I'm going to share with you is uh, an essay called "National Day of the Journalist," and it appeared um, summer before last in Iron Horse Literary Review. Uh, some of this material is familiar to you. Um, but it keeps coming back and coming back. And I wanted to read it in particular because I think we're about a week and a half away, our previous week and a half, the um, first year anniversary of the torture, dismemberment, and vicious murder of Jamal al Khashoggi, who was the uh, Saudi journalist a resident of the United States whose articles appeared uh, pretty regularly in the Washington Post. And he was just in Istanbul, Turkey, in order to get some uh, papers and stuff that he needed in order to marry his fiance. Okay. But this is not about that, it's just the, the occasion. Uh, uh, this is m more or less the old story. Uh, my story, and with some comes up a little bit into the present. Okay, it's how I got into journalism. All right. On June twentieth, nineteen seventy nine, during the Nicaraguan Revolution, American journalist Bill Stewart of ABC TV was stopped at a roadblock in Managua. He knelt and begged for mercy, but a Nicaraguan National Guardsman ordered him to lie flat and then shot him in the head killing him instantly. I'd seen the video of Bill Stewart's murder on TV, and four years later, right after I'd been hired to teach fiction writing at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, I decided I wanted to go to the Civil War in El Salvador as a journalist. I was a drunk. I'd never taken a journalism course or written a word of it, 
I'd also never been outside the United States, much less to a war zone. But I begged the editor of the Birmingham Post-Herald to give me a letter saying I worked for him, even though I didn't, and that was how my career as a freelance journalist began. Another American freelance journalist, John Sullivan, had been kidnapped on his first night in El Salvador. They later found his body dismembered on a dirt road. So I was a little nervous, but my Spanish was what worried me the most. And before I left Alabama, I memorized two important phrases, soy periodista and no me despari, por favor. I'm a journalist. Please don't shoot me. <laughs> on my very first morning in El Salvador, I was about to get on the hotel elevator to go down for breakfast when a woman came running up and grabbed me by the elbow and said, the boys have hit ten and cinco. Um, Want to go? I said, sure, grab my gear, we headed out, but I didn't know what she was talking about. I didn't know what ten and cinco was. I didn't know who the boys were. Altogether, there were five of us. We took two cars in case one broke down. The woman who'd grabbed me by the elbow was from the BBC. She was in the first car. I was in the car uh, driven by Joe Frazier, the Associated Press correspondent for Central America. He was a Marine combat veteran of Vietnam, and when I mentioned that I heard a lot of thunder in the distance, even though the sky was blue, he looked at me as if I'd just crawled out from under a haystack and said, that's war, man, are you kidding me? Joe told me that his wife, Linda Frazier, was also a journalist. They had a nine-year-old son, and the family had been living together in El Salvador, but Joe had decided it was too dangerous for them there. So he told Linda she would have to take their son and go somewhere safe. Fortunately, Linda found a job with a newspaper in peaceful and democratic Costa Rica. But Joe told me he sure did miss her. When we got to the outskirts of this town called Tenancingo, it was Joe Frazier who told us all what to do. Despite the sound of rifle fire and mortar explosions, we walked out in the open and up a hill past the fresh graves of the Salvadoran soldiers who had been killed in the fighting, and past the blood and urine-soaked mattresses in the rooms where they had made their last stand. We were followed by shirtless and shoeless children who were taking turns rolling a metal hoop up the hill with a stick. Then Joe stopped us, listened, and said the mortars weren't being walked our way. So we continued to a store at the top of the hill where two gorillas were loading bags of salt onto the back of a one-eared horse. The gorillas had automatic weapons, and they wouldn't respond to any questions. The storekeeper, though, wouldn't shut up. He was furious at the gorillas for stealing his salt, and the children just sat on a rotting bench in the corner to listen to their argument. On the wall hung an old calendar with a faded portrait of Jesus on it. And the children, who were skin and bones, with distended bellies and unhealed sores, looked up at that calendar and then turned to me and smiled. I believe these were the children about whom Jesus had said, Forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Later that week, I met three young sisters at an internal refugee camp. When I asked why they'd come to the camp, the older one stepped forward and said, when we opened the front door this morning, our father's head was there. I believe it was the children of El Salvador who changed the course of my life. I sobered up for one thing, and wherever I went after that, it would be the children who would show me what I needed to see or tell me what I needed to hear. That December, on my second trip to El Salvador, I met the famous Newsweek photographer, John Hoagland, at an impromptu airport news conference with Vice President George H.W. Bush. H.W. was a favorite with the American press in El Salvador. He respected us, and we respected him. So he just rolled up his sleeves, loosened his tie, and talked passionately about the horror of the Salvadoran death squads. Instead of taking a photo of Bush, though, I took a photo of John Hoagland taking a photo of Bush. But then five months later, on March 16, 1984, 
John Hoagland was killed in crossfire on the road to Suchitoda. He had been one of a number of foreign journalists whose names had appeared on a death squad hit list, so we questioned the circumstances, of course. We even tried to retrace Hoagland's trip to Suchitoto, but there were signs that the road had been mined, so we turned back, probably for the best, since two other American journalists, Dial Torgerson of the Los Angeles Times and Richard Cross of US News and World Report, would later be killed in Honduras when their own car ran over a remotely detonated mine. Then two months after John Hoagland's death, the unthinkable happened. On May 30th, 1984, a terrorist bomb exploded during a press conference at a place called La Penca on the banks of the Rio San Juan, the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica. Seven people were killed, many others were injured, three of the dead were journalists. Joe Frazier was staying at the Intercontinental Hotel in Managua when he got the news that a red-headed foreign journalist, a woman, had been among the dead. He knew it was Linda. And he told a friend that he would have to go to Costa Rica and tell their son what had happened and that that was something he wouldn't wish on anybody. Years later, Costa Rican President Oscar Arias would declare May 30th the National Day of the Journalist in Costa Rica. In the fall after the La Pinca bombing, my photographer friend Jim Neal and I wanted to interview Salvador's greatest artist, Fernando Yort. He lived in La Palma in a province that had seen some of the fiercest fighting of the war. I asked the Miami Herald reporter who had just been up there what the situation was like. He said it was calm. The fighting had moved somewhere else. So Jim and I got hold of Rudy Rivera, our translator and driver, told him our plans. Rudy was a hell of a lot of fun to be with, but calm and collected when the going got rough. Next day, we headed toward La Palma, and just south of the town, we saw some gorillas on the side of the road. So we stopped to interview them. But I'd ask only two questions before we and the gorillas came under automatic weapons fire. Jim and I ran for a ditch and hunkered down in raw sewage while Salvadoran soldiers poured fire toward us and the gorillas. Jim got a great photo of two gorillas under fire, but I just lay there in that shit and thought, this is going to be a terrible place to die. But eventually the shooting stopped, the gorillas had fled, and I heard Rudy yell for us to come out of the ditch. He had hidden behind a tree and was now in the middle of the road with his hands behind his head. He was surrounded by soldiers, and I thought they were going to shoot him on the spot. But he just turned to me and said, Hey, Dennis, um, you want to ask these guys some questions? And I said, Hell no, I want to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> God. So Jim and I hung out the windows of Rudy's car and hooped and hollered all the way back to the Capitol. Greatest adrenaline high I'd ever been on. The younger journalists at the hotel were envious because we had achieved the newbie's dream to get shot at without getting shot. But you know, that story's not quite as funny as it used to be. Because when our president refers to American journalists as enemies of the people, he reminds me of the Salvadoran army colonel who said that any journalist caught interviewing guerrillas ought to be considered an enemy combatant. All right, y'all still with me? Jump forward to 9-11, 2001. Among the nearly 3,000 dead that day were news photographer Thomas Pecorelli, who was on American Airlines Flight 11 as it crashed into the North Tower, and Bill Biggert, who was on the street photographing the fall of the North Tower. Robert Stevens, a tabloid photography editor, died during the anthrax scare that followed. Then Daniel Pearl of the Wall Street Journal was kidnapped and beheaded by terrorists in Pakistan in 2002. Michael Kelly, who'd worked for the New York Times, Washington Post, and many other periodicals, died in Iraq in 2003, as did American television journalist David Bloom. 
Military journalist James P. Hunter died in Afghanistan in 2010. And Marie Colvin, one of the most experienced and battle-hardened American journalists of either sex, died in 2012 in Homs, Syria, after being individually targeted by dictator Bashar al-Assad's artillery. In 2012, I walked into northern Syria alone. It was two days after American journalist James Foley had been kidnapped there. Jim had previously survived kidnapping and imprisonment in Libya during the Qaddafi dictatorship, but this time in Syria, he would be tortured for nearly two years before being beheaded by ISIS. And in 2013, two weeks after one of my trips into Aleppo, Syria, American journalist Steve Sotloff was kidnapped by ISIS on the same two-lane road I'd taken. Like Jim, Steve would be tortured for many months before ISIS beheaded him in September of 2014. But American journalists haven't just been killed overseas or in wartime. In recent decades, Manuel de Dios Unanue, Doña St. Plite, James Edwin Richards, and Chauncey Bailey were all murdered at various locations in the United States by the subjects of their articles. And in 2015, Roanoke television reporter Allison Parker and photojournalist Adam Ward were shot to death on air by a disgruntled former colleague who then killed himself. But the most recent and most horrifying murder of American journalists, as you well know, occurred less than two years ago. On June 28, 2018, when a deranged gunman blasted his way into the offices of the Capitol Gazette in Annapolis, Maryland, and shot to death Gerald Fishman, Rob Heisen, John McNamara, Wendy Winters, and Rebecca Smith. Perhaps someday we'll have a president, like the president of Costa Rica, who will declare June 28th our National Day of the Journalist. But I think the real day of the journalist, the one that will mean the most to members of my trade, will be the day when an American president is elected who refuses to incite violence against the press. I want to thank uh, Diane for putting this conference together, and uh, and Jill uh, for writing a story that uh, uh, that people don't want to write, don't want to look at, and uh, I have the courage to do that. Uh, and Dennis, uh, on behalf of the people he writes for. Um, you just have to wonder what these uh, politicians um, uh, are so afraid of, you know. Um, I think how Joseph Stalin was uh, uh, so afraid of and disturbed by Anna Akhmatova's love poetry. Uh, it's just somehow refuted everything he was doing as a, as a dictator. Uh, I hadn't, um, I wish I'd gone first, <laughs> um, but I was late, uh, and I was late because I was dropped my daughter off at the uh, South Plains Wildlife Rehabilitation Center where she volunteers, and I dropped her off with a little friend of hers, um, and halfway back here, I got a text saying that her friend couldn't stay for some kind of liability reasons. She get bit by a squirrel or something, I don't know. Um, so I had to run back and get her and bring her home. Uh, so um, hence, uh, I'm late. Um, 
I believe we, this goes till noon. I just have some poems I'm gonna read. Um, I think about this uh, South Plains Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. I think about people there nursing baby birds. My daughter uh, worked there, you know, feeding barn swallow nestlings uh, with, uh, you know, forceps and that kind of care. And I try to hold that idea in my mind with the recent news that uh, in the last 50 years, Three billion birds uh, in North America have, well, the population has gone down by three billion birds. 29% of the population of bird life in North America is gone in the last uh, 50 years. And uh, uh, so I want to read a poem called Three Sins. Found behind our neighbor's yard, among other birds killed with a pellet gun, the black-chinned hummingbird I held in my palm. Our neighbor, confronted with the bodies, pled guilty to shooting at siskins, mourning doves, robins. But as for this one, he insisted on his innocence. Fair enough, even if he'd willed it. I don't think anyone could hit that tiny feathered meteor with a pellet. Besides, I could see the likely cause figured in the trumpet vine's new leaves, seized, shriveled in their first brilliant green, this reckless spring's third freeze. A failure of piety. That's what the ancients would make of weather like this. And then they'd try to mend their actions because seasons were an understanding they had with the gods. Before I handed over to the game warden the bag of dead birds I'd kept in the freezer, I held the black chin for the children, tilting toward the sun that gorget dark as coal. When its edge caught sun, Small feathers shone in dazzling violet like scales. What violation to set this fallen beauty before their unacclimated eyes? What sudden, what gorgeous bruising? It's kind of, the poem kind of gets at the question of what is it like to hold global warming in your hand? And it's kind of why I put together this panel, this sense of how do these, how do enormous issues bear on us just uh, day to day, you know, that's why it's called From Lubbock to whatever the rest of the title is. Um, this poem doesn't take place in Lubbock, except that I wrote it in Lubbock, and I remembered it in Lubbock. Um, Dennis and I are both wahoos, uh, which... Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> meaning uh, graduates of uh, University of Virginia. I don't know if you get to be a Wahoo by being a graduate school, you know, graduate. I think you got to be an undergrad to do it. Anyway, UVA, uh, UVA has kind of been famous lately for, uh, well, for beating Texas Tech in the NCAA championship, and then also for this. Uh, uh, parade of neo-Nazis uh, that happened uh, uh, last year. And, uh, I, and it's very, very disturbing to see these uh, torch-carrying Nazis parading and chanting in a place that where you've just spent so much time and such intimate time and such thoughtful time. And uh, so I think about another memory, to other, uh, something else that I took part in at that place. This is called Night Procession, Night Procession in Charlottesville. Ancestral ash trees loomed above the lawn, the gardens, the rooms where slaveholders' sons once came to learn the ways of gentlemen. Spring evening scented with blossom and soil. I recall a moon and the moon-like dome of Jefferson's temple squared circle, columned homage to a classical origin. We had come to hear a reading, but something was wrong. The room inside had filled, 
leaving a crowd of us outside, spilling down the stairs, bewildered and muttering. And then there came a movement, a kind of breath rolling outward, a commotion leaving the doors of the rotunda, and a figure moving through the crowd, and the crowd moving, as the word spread among us to the ballroom, the grand ballroom that will hold us all. On the streets, the usual torch parade of headlights, but we walked across the grass, past lanterns of dogwood bloom, a slow rustling wave like a wake, formed and drawn by a masterful ship of language and Gwendolyn Brooks at the helm. It was, uh, yeah, it was wonderful to see this, uh, this woman leading a, a crowd, a mass of people across the, the lawn at the UVA. Um, I think I have time for this one because it's, uh, it's a little longer, but it reads fast. It's a narrative poem. Uh, It's, uh, <clears throat> I don't believe that the speaker of a poem, this, this is sort of pretty much one of those true stories, but uh, it's dressed up a bit, and you know, the, I don't believe that the speaker of a poem needs to be likable. Uh, I think they do need to be vulnerable to some degree. Some degree. Uh, a phalarope is a kind of bird explained in the poem. This is called Phalarope and Carp. At just this time of year, phalaropes can be seen swimming above the dam. Dainty, crisply patterned birds, they pirouette on the water, stirring up minutia to eat. A seasonal delicacy to watch them, but no phalaropes today. Yesterday's storm water spills over the dam, swelling the catch basin, slicking across the paved road below. I'm looking down on all this, musing on what I might choose to do instead. When a blue pickup rumbles by, measled with rust and bondo, raises a spray of water, skids, and stops. What a dumbass, I'm thinking. And then the doors open, and gushing out like circus clowns, three kids, two women, one man, all in flip-flops, constituting one family or many or none, it's hard to guess. A woman rolls up her jeans, steps off the road into a frothy runnel cut by the overflow. She stoops, plunges her hands to the wrist, gropes, and in one motion clutches and scoops and flips a fat bronze carp onto the road. As it slithers on wet pavement, frantic to swim, the boy chases it, flailing with the net, and another scoop and fling and flopping carp, another and another, and now they're all scrambling and shouting and tossing fish into the truck bed, but the littlest girl screams at this sudden hail of monsters. So the man scoops her up and hoists her into the truck bed, but that's where the others are lobbing the fish. So she amps up her noise, prancing and flapping her arms, till again he grabs hold of her and this time slips and falls on his ass, but no harm. Still holding her, he rises and installs her at last in the cab of the truck, where now, like royalty in an opera box, she gazes upon the show. Me, I think I'm horrified but can't really tell. On one hand, this Three Stooges brutalization of carp, this carnage. On the other, a knowledge I have to admire that read so closely this weather and brought them to just this place, and then the skill in this woman's hands, the success. Maybe that's what moves me down to have a closer look. And most obligingly, the second woman's happy to grapple from the mess in the truck bed, a thick, armor-scaled loaf of carp to show me. We're going to eat them, she grins. I notice, and at once try not to notice, her teeth. So this is one family's bounty, or maybe two. This rainfall windfall of fish flushed down the dam. One could think of the Gospels 
and for a moment I do, but soon wince at the thought that every storm sewer and gutter, every dubious spot in every gasoline rainbow-stained parking lot on the east side of town drains down to this lake, and to the flesh of these bottom-feeding fish this gathering sees as opportunity. So much, so fast, like an accident, or near accident, and the weird quiet that follows, a coming to. And I'm about ready to leave when the first woman, the fish catcher, walks up with the net in her hand and shows us a crayfish found in the catch basin pool. I would no idea, nor any idea this family, too, would be pleased just to stop and quietly study a crayfish. Okay, my turn to be the dumbass who judged them by their frenzy. But I can only give the merest formality of a glance. I've seen enough. I'm not ready for beauty, however small, even if beauty's what I'd come here hoping for. Not now, not with those carp still flopping in the empty bed of the truck, beaten and beating like a heart. close on this poem called Assembly, uh, one of our rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, this poem is dated November 2016. Um, so what happened in November 2016 that might have agitated me, <laughs> might have made me mindful of racial discrimination? <clears throat> Assembly. Easily a thousand robins in the dawn, as I sit by the window and watch them assemble in bare November branches, the brown lawn, the garden beds full of leaves, riddling the yellow air with their rolling anthem of songs. They swirl and wave as if one. They swell and then surpass my wish to understand them. And this, aware but not knowing, is a welcome state of being, to be content merely to be among. Why then be thinking of a parking lot outside a supermarket earlier this month? We were both backing up, checking to the right, to the left, but failing to see each other directly behind until it was too late. My plastic taillight couldn't much damage the bumper of his pickup, already beat up from years of hauling stoves and fridges to help out a friend's business, so he explained. And my taillight's replacement wouldn't amount to the cost of a deductible. So faced with our mistake, there was no redress but to recount my side and his side of what just occurred. We talked and talked as if by talking we could somehow put these shards of cheap glittering plastic back into place. We made somehow a kind of company, though just the two of us, and though the problem we knew without saying was more than any busted tail light. Our conversation wandered toward the election, deploring when we got there the wreckage of language, jagged lies and slanders, thoughts cracked and broken down to the base idea that what constitutes an American is the grotesque assertion of whiteness, speeches that would make us all barbarian. Of course, that's not how we phrased it. We just talked, the way talking goes. It makes its way. Nor can I retrace which of us, as we shook hands to leave, first bent forward toward an embrace. But what stays with me is how ready I was to receive and give it, to have this stranger's face on my shoulder, mine on his. Cheesy, I might think, but it was beyond any thinking. It felt like we were species deeper than tribe or tribe's caricature, the mob rallied and goaded by slogans. 
What moved us, perhaps, was something like what moves the calling of these robins, only human. We spoke it in silence, and more, since one of us was white, one black, we spoke it in the history of our skins, the history born in two men, confused and at a loss, but both of us American, and each right then needing to lean himself on the other in order to carry on. Thank you very much. <laughs>